Now you gotta get a you gotta get a good look at this board. Look at that, huh? Someone said that's not a skateboard, that's a surfboard with wheels. Now, some of you are wondering what kind of church this is, if it's your first time here. This is what we do every week. No, why did I come in on a skateboard tonight? Well, I did it because I got this beautiful longboard here as a birthday present. 41st birthday. So, I guess uh, maybe this, some guys do some things for midlife crisis. Well, this is it. You know, it's really not midlife is the thing because uh, I don't see a lot of 80-year-old guys uh, driving skateboards. But uh, it was kind of funny. I went up to the youth camp and, uh, you know, there... They were all in shock when I rode the skateboard, and I was kind of bummed that they were so shocked because, they, you know, it's almost like a bear riding a bicycle or something like that, where you go, well, why is it so surprising to you? You know, I, I don't feel that old, but I guess to them I am. So when I came home uh, from a vacation to my office, uh, this was underneath the desk there, and the gift was given anonymously, uh, no name. Just a little sticky note on it that said, hey, happy birthday. And I would love to know who gave me this gift. You know why? So I can sue them. <laughs> I want to sue them when I get hurt or, or sue them if someone else gets hurt because everyone wants to borrow it now, you know. And at the very least, I would like to sue them for age discrimination <laughs> and defamation of character. Why is that? Well, let me read the rest of the note to you. It says, now that you are over the hill, you can ride down in style. <laughs> Woo! Now, that sounds like slander to me, and so you'll be hearing from my lawyer if I ever figure out who you were, but... I'm kidding, of course, I love the gift, and if I break my head bone, acting like the silver surfer out in the parking lot, I really have no one to blame but myself. Why? Because they also gave me this <laughs> skid lid here, and it had a note on it too. It said, so your wife can have peace. That's what, that's what it said. But you may notice I didn't have it on my head. I have it here in my hand. I had it up here on the stand. And the reason is because I wanted to give you a more clear understanding of some of the things we're going to talk about tonight in 1 Corinthians 6. And you may say, how does the helmet help with that? Well, I've entitled tonight's teaching, Life's Warning Labels. Life's Warning Labels. And inside this helmet, there is a long list of do's and don'ts on here. And it basically says, I'll boil it down for you. It basically says, if you don't strap the helmet on your head, it can't help you. And the label goes on to say, in many other words, basically this. Wearing a helmet is not a substitute for using your brain. Okay? Just because you have one of these on your head doesn't mean all of a sudden everything is okay. And so, as a man, I know one of the man laws that's out there is that you never read the instructions, right? That's kind of an admission of weakness in a way. It's, it's kind of not the thing that we do as guys. But I love to, to read the warning labels. That's one part of the instructions I always read. Why? Because I get a laugh out of them. Uh, there was one that I saw that maybe you'll enjoy. It was on a kid's bike helmet, and it said, not intended for military use. <laughs> now, you think about that again. Do they really need to say that? Well, I guess in a way, they do. You know, you can picture a soldier off to war. Hey, honey, where's the Barbie bike helmet? I need to make sure that I'm protected while I'm there. Well, you see, we live in a society in which fewer and fewer people really are willing to take responsibility for their choices and the consequences of those choices. And so many play their favorite game, the blame game. It's not my fault. It's not my uh, reason that I did this. It's somebody else's fault or somebody should have warned me or made this impossible for me to do this and that kind of thing. And if I make a bad choice, well, I have to find somebody to point the finger at. I don't like the consequences. And so I'll sue you or I'll blame you. And I'm sure you've all heard of that infamous McDonald's lawsuit. And it was basically that, hey, I didn't know hot coffee was hot. And so millions of dollars were awarded. And so now every coffee cup that you see anywhere, in fact, the ones in our cafe right here, you can't sue us if you get burned because it says, warning, hot coffee is hot. 
And so, you think about some of the other wacky warnings that are out there in our world. One of my favorites, this is it, it was on a portable CD player. You know, those old kind that now they've been replaced kind of by MP3s and iPods and all the rest. But it was on a portable CD player and it said this, the Discman 2000 should not be used as a projectile in a catapult. <laughs> you can picture a guy opening the package and saying, man, that's why I bought it. I can't believe it. How, why can't I do that? Here's one off a of dog shampoo. It said, caution, the contents of this bottle should not be used to feed fish. You can picture someone washing the dog, you know, getting rid of the fleas, looks over and notices the fish look kind of hungry, finish the bottle on them. <laughs> Again, these things are too crazy for someone to have come up with. It's the kind of thing that somebody probably sued successfully and then they added it to the list and say, well, we've got to make sure that we warn them they can't do that. How about this one here? Do not drive car or operate machinery after using this medicine. Now that seems normal enough, but it was on a children's cough medicine. It's kind of like us saying to our daughter, six years old, sorry Carissa, can't drive the car to church tonight. You know, you got that little cough and it may kick in with the syrup and stuff. And then you've got on a laser printer cartridge, do not eat toner. Have you seen that one? <laughs> now we get pretty hungry around here in the office. It never crossed my mind to eat the toner out of the laser printer. Now, on a tiramisu, I might be a little more tempted by that, a dessert. It said, do not turn upside down. The problem was it said that on the upside down part of the box. So as soon as you turn it over to read the warning, you've already done what it said don't do. Here was one that the kids at the youth camp really liked. The toilet bowl cleaning brush said, do not use orally. Okay, it's not for a toothbrush if you see it there. Yeah. Christmas lights, you know, that comes around once a year, but this is what one package said, for indoor or outdoor use only. <laughs> now, some of you are thinking, what else is there? Exactly, <laughs> what else is there? Superman Pajamas said this, this cape does not give the wearer the ability to fly. And I remember reading <laughs> the story about someone who didn't understand that. Now, hair dryer, this was on a hair dryer, warning, do not use in the shower and never use while sleeping or unconscious. <laughs> a popular manufactured fireplace. We've got a few more here. A fireplace log. You know, you don't use those much in, my, in Miami, but, but maybe you would. Uh, one of those little kind that you light the paper and the, and the thing lights on fire, and it said, caution, risk of fire. <laughs> uh, that's why I bought it. A 13-inch wheel on a wheelbarrow said this, not intended for highway use. You know, we were thinking about Trading in one of the cars on a wheelbarrow, just for better gas mileage. But uh, you'll get a laugh out of this one. It, on an iron, it said, do not iron while wearing the clothes. The, now, the reason it's particularly funny, if you see my wife tonight, she has a little burn on her arm. You know why? She was ironing this shirt on me, in spite of this warning, because the iron didn't say that. And, hey, try as we might, we ended up getting hurt uh, doing it. So, sometimes we don't see our own warnings. And then... Finally, baby stroller. This is what it said. Warning, remove child before folding. <laughs> Maybe we should have that painted there in the children's ministry. Now, not all risks and warning and choices and consequences are quite this ridiculous and obvious to us. And I do believe life could and should come with some warning labels. And, in fact, it does. That's what I find that God's word in so many ways is. It has words of warning for us. And we ignore those to our own detriment and the detriment of others. In Corinthians, the whole letter is primarily a corrective letter. It's primarily saying, hey, don't do it this way. Don't do what these folks did. And so we've titled the whole series, Pedro and I have titled that Writing Wrongs as we're going through it. Writing Wrongs. And that's what Paul was doing. And each week we'll have a new opportunity to learn from some of the worst examples the church has ever seen. And so in this chapter, it's almost like Paul is kind of sticking some warning labels on their spiritual life and saying, hey, don't make the same mistake. Don't do it this way. Caution. Serious injury or death even can result from these things. And so 1 Corinthians 6, if you'll look at it with me tonight, it's, again, life's warning labels. And the warnings in, in 1 Corinthians 6 are not nearly as funny or as big a joke as the ones that I shared with you there. But we're going to look tonight at four warnings. And we ignore these, again, to our own harm, to our own hurt, and very often the hurt and harm of others. And so warning number one, this is it as Paul puts his pen down for them. 
your rights can become wrongs. Your rights can become wrongs. And he says there in verse 1, right off the start, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Now what is Paul worked up about here? He's saying, dare you do this? How could you possibly think that this is a good thing to do? Well, what was so shocking to Paul is that Christians in Corinth were suing the pants off each other. Fussing and fighting, and not only there in the church, which is bad enough, but they were taking it out into the alley, taking it out into the streets, in the public forums, the public places, they were fighting in front of the heathens. And so I remind you that Corinth is there in Greece, and the Greeks were well known, very well known, for their worldly wisdom, for their argumentative ability, for their logic, for their law. They loved to debate. They loved to dispute. For them, it was just a game. And they, like so many of us, uh, well, we may find ourselves in the middle of a lawsuit. You know, it was the land of lawsuits, really. And the public trials were a, really a spectator sport of sorts. And so long before the People's Court and Judge Wapner and Judge Judy and all these types of things, well, those would have been a great hit if they had had cable TV in those days because Corinth was a place of law and disorder. It was a place in which... Uh, really, everyone was fighting all over the place and using the law for those purposes. Many frivolous things and just looking for that money motive. And so the Corinthian Christians here got caught up in all that. They were clogging the courts worse than anyone else with their pro property disputes and their relationship issues and all the rest. And so when it came to the civil matters there in Corinth, well, they were the most uncivilized of the people. And so warning label number one that Paul puts on it there is he says, hey, your rights can so quickly become wrongs if you don't do it right. You see in verse 2 it says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Now, again, I like to pick up some of the phrases that Paul puts down here. All throughout this chapter, if you're taking notes, there's six times, six times in this one chapter that he uses this same phrase. Do you not know? Do you not know? Now, that's a... Statement where he's saying, hey, there's some ignorance. There's something that needs to be known. And that's in verse 2, verse 3, verse 9, verse 15, 16, and 19. So 2, 3, 9, 15, 16, 19. All those times he says, don't you know this? And he's kind of saying, isn't this kind of obvious? I mean, do we really have to go over it? But he realizes, yes, we do have to go over it because he looked at what was going on there in Corinth and he said, I better warn them. You know, sometimes we look at some of those wacky warnings and say, would anyone really be dumb enough to do that? Well, I guess somebody was, or they wouldn't have put it on the list. And so Paul, he sees how they're acting, and he comes to a conclusion. You know what? I do need to put this warning label on people's lives, because it's better safe than sorry. So warning number one, your rights can quickly become wrongs. And most of the things that people fight over in this life, if you really boil it down, they're very minor matters especially in the light of eternity. And that's what Paul's trying to get them to do here, is look at it that way. That's why he says at the end of verse 2, hey, the smallest matters. And he didn't know the ins and outs of every matter, but he kind of saying, hey, you know, this is probably some pretty unimportant stuff when you really look at it globally and even beyond that. And so a mark of maturity in our life is to come to realize what matters and what doesn't. What's worth fighting for and what isn't. And years ago, I came into a room and, I found a couple of kids kind of wrestling around on the ground, and they weren't having fun. It wasn't fun fighting. It was they were actually very upset. They were kind of duking it out, and they were all red in the face and angry eyes and everything. And I got in between them, and I said, what's going on here? And this was the problem. She took my eraser. She took your eraser? Yeah! Like that's the end of the world, and there's a whole drawer of erasers right over there. Yeah, but this is my eraser, blah, blah, you know, and they wanted to go at it again. You, you realize, hey, that's immaturity, isn't it? But so often it's the same thing in our life that we'll look at something and go, yeah, but they, blah, 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 blah. And if you really looked at it, it's like they took your eraser. That's why you're so upset. And so Paul reminds them and he reminds us, look, so much of what we fuss and fight about, almost everything really, in fact, in this life, when you stretch it out against eternity is a very minor matter compared to what's coming. And that's what he talks about in verse 3. He says, Do you not know that we'll judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? If you have judgments concerning the things pertaining to this life, do you, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? 
And he says, I say, I'm saying this to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you? Not even one who'd be able to judge between the brethren? And so he's, again, kind of using some strong language with them, some probing questions here. And he says, you know what? Don't you remember that God is preparing us for eternity? That there's not just this life and this is all there is and you got to make the best of what you got right now because this is all there is. He says, there's so much more than this. This is just the dress rehearsal. And the Bible isn't really clear on the specifics of our role in eternity, of all that it will entail. But you know what? It will not be this. It will not be sitting on a cloud playing a harp. You know, bring through all countless ages. Bring, you know, and you go, man, I don't want to go to heaven. I got to figure some other alternative. No, it's going to be better than we've ever thought, more incredible than we could possibly imagine. That's what the Bible says. And so it says, you know, I really, even if I tried to explain it to you, you wouldn't get it. So I'm not going to even waste my breath. But God does say, hey, you'll be ruling, you'll be reigning with Christ. And when he returns, one of the things we'll do is judge the angels. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen those bumper stickers that say angels watching over me or whatever. And, and, and you know, that's fine. But but some people think, oh, I'm going to judge the angels. You know, why weren't you there when I wrecked on my skateboard and you were supposed to watch over me and you didn't guard me right or whatever else? No, that's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about fallen angels, the demonic realm, and that's a very real realm, just as much as God. You see these things. There was an angelic rebellion, the Bible says, in which one-third of the angels sided with Satan. And so Jesus is the judge, obviously. Don't picture yourself there in a robe with a gavel judging Satan. But the point is this. It's like we're there as exhibit A. How, how do I say it that way? Well, it's this way. <laughs> it's like Jesus can point over to my life and your life and say, look, I made them out of mud and they followed me willingly. And look at you. You were so much grander <laughs> and you chose to do things your own way. And so here he's saying, you know what? Our life will judge angels. Our Lives will be a, uh, an example through all eternity to people. And he's saying, with this kind of role that God has for you, couldn't you do a little better and differently here in this life? And so Paul's asking rhetorically, isn't there anybody there at the church who could solve these things? Isn't there anybody with enough insight into things and enough godly wisdom who could maybe uh, hear these cases instead of going to the heathens to hear them? And so he's asking them, do you value the help of the heathens? far more than the help of the Holy Spirit that's found in the church. And so even the most ordinary believer, what he's saying here kind of is the most ordinary believer can be more insightful than the most educated unbeliever. Why? Because God gives gifts to his people, as we'll see. And you may remember the story of King Solomon. I think it's a great story. It's a case of a king who came to his power fairly young, didn't know what he was going to do, and he said, hey, God, you've got to give me the wisdom. God said, I'll give you anything in the world. He could have asked for everything, and he said, I want wisdom. I need wisdom to govern your people. And guess what? God gave him that, King Solomon. And there was a case, and it's a good case. It's interesting. There were two women who came to him, and there was one baby. One of the lady's babies had died, and this was before DNA testing and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like, which baby died and which baby lived and which mom is the real mom and all these types of things. The babies look similar, all that kind of stuff, and they didn't know how to solve it. They bring it to King Solomon. And he says, hey, bring the baby out here, cut the baby in half, and give each lady half. And you go, man, that's the wisdom God gave me? Yeah, well, they didn't carry through with it. Because right then, one of the ladies says, no, don't do it. Save the baby. Give it to her. Give it to her. And he says, that's the real mom. That's the real mom. The one who was willing even to lose her own comfort and everything else for the sake of the baby. The other one didn't care about the child and would have willingly let him cut him in half and said, well, that's it. It's very obvious in those cases. Now, that's just one of those things that you say, man, God gives that kind of insight. God gives that kind of wisdom. And he's saying here, a spiritual person can see both the physical and the spiritual, the emotional, and all of that package. But you know what? An unspiritual person, no matter how smart they are, the only brain they have is their own. They don't have the mind of Christ, and that is a shortcoming that they're going to have that even the church can do better than that, even in the most uh, ordinary of people. And so you see verse 6, the brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, Paul says, it's already an utter failure. 
for you that you go to law against one another? Don't, why don't you rather accept the wrong? Why don't you rather let yourself be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Now, this is a section of Scripture, again, that's strong words, and I know we maybe in, in different cases have been wronged. And this is the very thing that we need the Spirit of God to be able to do because this is so different than what the world wants to do, which is when I'm wrong, I want my rights. But again, the warning label he sticks on it is, you know what, sometimes our rights can so quickly become wrong. And you see it's a section of Scripture. I have heard people use this maybe in a different light to say, you know what, there is no ability ever to right a wrong. There's no reason ever to go to court or to be involved in a lawsuit or help convict a criminal or any of that. That's not the context that Paul is talking about here. Remember, it, context is king. You have to pay attention when you read the Bible. Who's he talking to and for what reason? The issue here was the witness before the world. The witness here was the fact that there was a reason and there was a result. What was it, the reason they were going to court? Well, no good reason. It was my rights, my money, my revenge. I want it. I deserve it. That sort of thing. And he was saying, no, that is a bad witness to the world that you want the same things the world wants, the same way the world wants it. You have that mentality, well, I'll never have to work again if I sue that. No, he's saying that's not going to work. And you see also the result. What was the result? Well, this is the question. What will this legal battle do to the cause of Christ? See, very few people ask that question sometimes. What will be the result in the eyes of other people? If I win this, what will they do? Will God be glorified? Will they say, man, that is justice served? Or will they look at it and say, that is shame on the name of Jesus that someone would do that and call themselves a Christian? And so as Christians, our goal should be the glory of God, and it should be the spread of the gospel. Those are the important things. Those are the major matters. The minor matters, well, it's kind of everything else, even if I get wronged. And it's not whether I'm treated fairly in this life, because you won't be. Jesus wasn't. His followers won't be. Or whether I can make lots of money off my misery. No, there's going to be trouble in this world. And Jesus certainly could have brought an unlawful death lawsuit for what happened to him on the cross. But when you think about it, a Christian suing a Christian... Even if you win, guess what? You still lost. If the world looks on and says, that's what Christianity is all about, well, that can be an utter failure. That can be a complete defeat. And remember, nobody who accepts wrong in this world for the sake of God's glory will ever feel like they got the raw end of the deal. Maybe in this life, yes. But again, Paul's trying to remind us we're supposed to be different. We live as if this isn't the only life there is because it isn't the only life there is. And so... Often he's saying to them, hey, just appeal to the higher court. You mean the Supreme Court? Should I take it to the Supreme Court? Well, no, even higher than that, the judgment seat of Christ. And he says, you're just sometimes going to have to wait for justice to be served there, and it will. And so warning label number one, as Christians, hey, our rights can quickly become wrongs. Warning label number two, you can't sin and win. This is where he comes in verse 9, kind of turning the corner here and saying, you know, let's think about the context. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, he says. Neither fornicators or idolaters or adulterers nor homosexuals nor sodomites nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's pretty clear as we read it. And it's another verse 9, do you not know as you think about it. And it's kind of, again, Paul saying, isn't it obvious? Do I really need to say this this clearly? Well, I guess I do, he says. Uh, based on the behavior that he was observing, based on the things that he saw in the culture and the church, he says, I guess I do need to stick a little warning label on sin and tell you this. You know what? You cannot sin and win. Don't be deceived. You can't live like hell and still expect to go to heaven. And the unrighteous will not spend eternity with God. Punto. That's what he's saying there. Verse 9 and 10 are an example of what we see in several places in the Scripture. Uh, I call them sinless. You know, just kind of some long uh, lists of different activities and attitudes and different things that are clearly sin. And maybe some of us can look down or some of you can look down on 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and think, well, good, I'm off the hook. I'm nowhere on that list. I'm not a sodomite, I don't think, whatever that is. I'm not a drunkard. I'm not a thief or some of those things there, you know. And we tend to be, I believe, sometimes as believers, pretty 
vocal, pretty venomous even sometimes against certain sins and kind of close our eye to other ones, you know. Oftentimes ones that we personally struggle with, well, you know, we're all human and God's grace and all that sort of thing. And one we don't, have never struggled with, well, that's an abomination. I can't believe that, you know. And some people, again, are very outspoken on things like homosexuality, you know. But not, not so upset about coveting. Well, you know, coveting, that's not nearly as gross in God's eyes. But you know what's in the same list? And they're both sin, and they're both something that will keep a person out of heaven if not repented of, and if there's not a receiving of Jesus into a person's life for real, lasting change. And so, you see, thinking about another list in another spot, Galatians 5.19. Galatians 5.19, you might want to write this one down, and if you survive this list here in 1 Corinthians 6, this one will definitely get you. I'll, I'll show you why. Galatians 5.19. It's talking about the works of the flesh. And this is what it says. It says they're evident. It says they're obvious. They're not something that anyone could really reasonably discuss, although some people would want to. But he says it's so obvious. They're adultery. He says fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, mm. jealousies, wow, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, hm. dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and you say, man, I'm still doing all right. But the last phrase, and the like. Oh, no. That's one of those kind of all of the above or none of the above kind of questions where you go, oh, no, it's, there's some other stuff in there. And the like. You know what he's saying there? Even if your set of sins, and we all have a set, even if it's not specifically listed in this list here, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there's no way that anyone could get to the end of a list that ends with and the like and still say, no, nah, I don't have any problem with any of those things. And see, I think there's a lot of reactions when it comes to talking about sin like this. And the first one is this. Well, I disagree with one of the things on that list. I don't agree that that's a sin. I think we ought to be a little different, more modern and that sort of thing. Those aren't sin. Those are diseases. Don't you know that? Don't you know that those are this or that or choices that people make or, uh, you know, it's because of something that some, someone had happened to them and these types of things, acceptable alternatives. It's just the way I am. I was born this way or something like that. Blame it on others, that type of thing. Well, that's one reaction. That one's not right. There's another reaction, which is, you know what, to come down on all of those things and sit on a high horse and start pointing fingers at somebody else instead of dealing with the sin in our own lives. But then there's a third way, which is as a Christian, to begin to struggle with something on one of those lists or to have a persistent problem with one of those things on that list and start feeling the condemnation that comes from being somebody who is a sinner, who's forgiven by the grace of God and yet still has some problems. Because guess what? Everybody still has some problems. And so, you know, you look at that thing and you say, well, maybe I'm not going to heaven at all. None of those are the ways that we want to look at it. How do we want to look at it? Think about this. The issue is the practice of sin versus the presence of sin in our life. You know what? Practice, they say, makes perfect. And I certainly know what it is to be a person who wants to practice sin to get better at it. You know what I'm talking about? Where you're like, man, if I could just do this a little bit more, I could get a whole lot better than I am already. I'm kind of amateurish in my sin, but I'd like to get better. Well, that's what he's talking about here. Those who practice such things are not going to get into the kingdom of heaven. That's not the way you get there. But the presence of sin, well, our righteousness comes from faith in Jesus Christ. And it is his sinlessness that is our forgiveness, not our sinlessness that is our forgiveness. And so you think about that, we all have to deal with the presence of sin. But there's no excuse for the practice of sin. As long as we're in these bodies, as long as we're in this sinful world, oh yeah, there's going to be falling into things. There's going to be mistakes made. There's going to be need for ongoing forgiveness. But none of those things is the same thing as saying, you know what, I don't want to repent this really isn't a sin. I'm going to rationalize it. And I don't need God because God accepts me just the way I am in all of my sin without Jesus. Well, that's a much, much different thing. And so that's warning number two that he's giving here. Don't be deceived. You can't sin and win. And if your life has not changed at all since coming to Christ, Paul would put it 
that way to say, well, maybe you haven't really come to Christ. Maybe all you've done is come to church. And that is very, very different. See, even God's people make mistakes. But you think of Noah getting drunk. Did he keep getting drunk and keep getting drunk and keep getting drunk and keep getting drunk? No, he got drunk. And what happened? He paid some price for it and he repented of it and he got back and the Lord dealt with him and God gave him grace and all of these things. Now you see also David. He was an adulterer. We saw that just in a recent teaching. He was a murderer. But you don't see 42 cases of him continuing to be an adulterer and continuing to be, you say, wait a minute. He, he's sinning the Christian way. What is that? Well, to repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness and to move on and to let the Lord change you. And yes, he can forgive even the second and third and fourth and fifth time. But here's the question. Where is your heart? Is your heart, man, I want to practice this and I don't want anyone to try to stop me. Or is it, Lord, help me with this. I like the analogy of a river. You know, it flows in a certain direction. If you've ever watched rivers, they flow in a certain direction. Now, I just got back from Colorado, and there, you know, you get to see all kinds of cool things with rivers, and, and they're flowing strong, but, you know, sometimes they curve back and even go the other way for a little while, and they go this way, and they go that way, and they're twisting down through this valley. But guess what? That water is flowing in one direction, and it is going to end up in one destiny. Why? Because it is that River flowing that way. It doesn't mean that your life's never going to take a twist or a turn or never going to go back, even for a few miles, and you go, man, I'm going the wrong direction. That's right. But you can get right. And there's still time to change the road you're on. And so that's what it is to understand these things. Because if the things on these lists are more a description of what we are than what we were, well, there is a problem, and Jesus is the solution. And so he says in verse 11, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And you see four times in one verse, four, four times the same word, were, 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 four times there. And I like to cross-reference this verse, 2 Corinthians 5.17, and this is the freedom and the joy found in Christ. It says, therefore, if anyone's in Christ... They are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so again, though it's a popular refrain in our society for all types of sin. Well, I was born this way. Precisely. That's why you need to be born again a different way. And that's the promise that Jesus has given to every sinner, great and small. There is no sin so great that God can't change it. There's no sin so small that God doesn't need to change it. And so you see in verse 11, that past tense, he's saying, hey, you were washed. This is good. And the youth, I, I was up there at the youth camp, and uh, if there's one thing I know, they have, are going to bring home some dirty clothes. That's for sure. They, they are a muddy mess. If you haven't looked at the website, uh, basically just one big mud fest. And I found myself with my wife saying, is that one of our I think that is maybe one of our kids, that, that little mud pie there is one of ours. And here's the thing, when they come back, they're going to be clothes to be thrown away, not washed even, just throw them away. And this is what Paul is kind of reminding them of those two truths, saying, look, such, such some of you were. I mean, let's, let's be honest, such some of you were. We're not sitting on some high horse here of thinking we're so different than the world. No, such some of us were. We know exactly what that's all about. But this is what you are. This is what you are, washed, sanctified, justified by God's grace. And what he's calling them to and calling us to is be what you are, not what you were. And that's one of those things that God can allow us to do through any circumstance of life. And so how foolish and how strange it would seem if my kids came home with their muddy, stinky clothes and said, let's keep them that way. And I want to get back in them now that I've taken a shower. And you say, wait, why would you want to do that? And so one of the things I love about this church here is that there's a lot of hardcore heathens here. If some of the ladies knew some of the background of some of the guys, they'd probably bring their purse in a little closer. You know, you so, uh, better be just a little more sure here. But you know what? Jesus said something really cool, which is the one who's forgiven much loves much. You know what that means? That sometimes somebody who knows what they were is really happy with what they are and really thankful to God for what they are and don't ever want to be what they were. 
again. But they're not going to look down on someone who's still in the worst stage because they say, man, I know exactly what it is. And I know how empty that was. And I know how uh, frustrating that was. And I know how much I tried to change on my own until I came to Christ who changed me from the inside out. And so there's no way we will be habitually unrighteous if we come to Christ. But there's no way we'll be self-righteous if we really remember what we were and what he's done in our life. And so, warning label number one, your rights can become wrong. Warning label number two, you can't sin and win. The third warning label, if you're writing it down, the lawful can be awful. The lawful can be awful. Now, verse 12, it's just a single verse that has so much in it that it could literally radically change your life if you really understand this part right here. Paul says a little quote, and he says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, most scholars looking at this in the construction of the original language believe that Paul is quoting a quote from them and then responding to it when he says, All things are lawful for, for me. Well, that was something the Corinthians were throwing around, just a little phrase, Hey, I heard about God's grace. All things are lawful for me. And Paul says, well, okay, that is true if, if you allow me to elaborate on it. See, Paul warns the difference here, a very big difference between the lawful and the awful. And the Corinthians were taking some of Paul's preaching out of context, as so many people do, and applying them in such a way that they're saying, hey, all things are, are lawful, right? I mean, I've been forgiven, I've been freed, I've, I, God's grace, He'll forgive me of any and all sin, so why not sin? There's no consequence, right? And this is what I call grace abuse, or, you, or mistaking grace for grease. They're two very different things. Uh, grace does not allow you to slide into sin like grease. Now, there's a threefold test that I think could, could really make such a difference in your life if you write it down and think it through. This is verse 12 here. He talks about it. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Uh, just putting that little thing on, on something and saying, well, there's no law against it, but is this helpful? Is it helpful for me? Is it going to advance me spiritually? Is it going to advance others spiritually? Is it helpful? Oh, yeah, I could do it, and even be forgiven. But is it helpful? Is it going to put me further down the road I want to go on, or is it going to take me back on the road I don't want to go on? Does it have more to do with who I am in Christ or who I was before Christ? And so that's the first one. And then he also says, all things are lawful for me, okay, but I will not be brought under the power of anything. See, Christ, it says it's for freedom that Christ set us free. We were in bondage before Christ. So what a crazy idea it would be for me to finally be freed from prison and say, man, I can't wait to get back inside that cell. Well, well wait, sir, you're free. You can go. No, 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 I'll just sleep here tonight on the concrete bunk. You go, what are you talking about? You don't have to go back that way. Yeah, but I want to go back that way. And he's, that's what he's saying right here. Will it bring you back under its power? Because... Jesus has broken the power of sin in a person's life, given them the ability to say no to that. Why would I say yes to what brought me in bondage in the first place? And so that's what he's saying there. And, I, and just evaluating those decisions as you're facing some alternative, is this going to bring me under its power? I'm not saying that I can't do it or that there's some verse somewhere that says don't do that, but is this going to bring me under its power? Am I going to end up a slave to it instead of free in Christ. And then you see one that we'll see later in the chapter, actually, or later in the book, 1 Corinthians 10, I'll just tell you that, and it's later in that chapter. Paul again uses this phrase, and he says, all things are lawful for me, but I'm not going to do anything that would cause somebody else to stumble. What does that mean? That means I put a limit on my freedom sometimes because of love. See, I, I might be free to go do something. We did some rock climbing when we were in Colorado, and I was there with my family, and I was there with a younger child, and, and I'm free to go up and down the rocks and everything. And, but would I do that in such a way that would entice my six-year-old to fall down the cliff? No. But there's no law against it. There's no warning that says, I can't wait a minute. Why would I want somebody else to get hurt as a result of my freedom? That's what he's saying here. And so... So many Christians live in this kind of mentality, which is how close to the edge can I come? 
Uh, I'm not in sin yet. Woohoo! Got half my foot over it. How about now? Some of you are getting nervous already. But you think about that and you say, that is not the life that Christ has called us to. It's not how close to sin can I get without falling in. It's how close to Christ can I come. How much can I say, hey, I want to be somebody who has an effect on the world around me, not for bad, but for good. And so the lawful in our life can be awful. Not something that specifically the Bible is going to say, you can't do that, here's the verse. And so many people, when they get into that, saying, well, you can't show me where it says I can't do that. Well, again, that threefold test will keep you in a spot of God's blessing like nothing else. You see, warning number one, your rights can become wrong. Warning number two, it's that you cannot sin and win. And the third warning was the lawful can be awful. And then that brings us to the fourth and final one that we'll spend time on tonight, which is you need to control your urge to merge. And that is found in verse 13. You see, he starts talking about food. He says, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy both it and them. Now, the body's not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, right away you might say, how did he get from food to sex? Well, let me talk about it real quickly with you here. Paul's addressing the issue of immorality, and he is, again, responding to things that he saw going on in Corinth. And there was a philosophy and even a phrase that was very popular in that day, which is that food for the stomach, the stomach for food. Isn't it obvious this is the, the need and here's what fills it? And so the Corinthians were a culture that had no problem overindulging in any and every one of their appetites without restraint. And so here they say, hey, you know, God obviously gave us a stomach. What are you supposed to put in it? Food. He says, well, there's other parts of the body. What am I supposed to do with it? Sex. And so that's their argument. My body has many needs. And it's only natural to meet them whenever and however I want to. So when I'm hungry, I eat what I want. When I get the urge to merge, well, I meet it. I do just that. Food for the stomach, sex for the body, fast food, fast sex. It's all good. And so warning number four, this is what Paul says to him. No, you've got to learn to control your urge to merge. Because God doesn't want you to have fun. Not at all. You look at it, and, and it's, it's a much deeper and much more full understanding than that. See, he goes on to say some stuff that basically says this. We're not just natural, guys. We're not just animals with appetites. We're not just modified, mutated monkeys, although our society, of course, wants us to believe that. We're not just some accident of spontaneous combustion or something like that. You know, we have a destiny and we have a dignity that is different than the animals. And so verse 14, God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. And this is what he says in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot, a prostitute? Certainly not. Or do you not know? There's another of those phrases. Don't you know this? That he who is joined to a prostitute, a harlot, is one body with her? For the two he says, shall become one flesh. Now, this last part here of verse 16 is a quote from Genesis 2.24. Okay? It's going all the way back to the beginning, to God's design for marriage, which is a man and a wife for life. And it says, the two shall become one. Now, notice that God's word is very precise. It doesn't say, the 1,000 shall become one for one night or maybe a weekend or maybe a year even or something like that. No, Corinth, see, it had a thousand temple prostitutes. Uh, that's a lot uh, in the city. And they actually had sexual immorality as part of their religious practice, as part of their worship service. Uh, you know, it was just a big orgy. And a lot of people, of course, probably were very faithful in their attendance to church, you know, at that point. It's like, hey, Mom, go for services this weekend. I'll be there, you know, youth group and all the rest. No, we just got back from the camp, and one of the things they do there, and I think it's really funny and good the way they do it, which is that they designate the guys as blue and the girls as red, and they say, hey, there's no purple, not for this weekend. There's no purple. You get red and blue together, you make purple. And they got the purple patrol out on you. They, got the, they call them the purple ninjas. And they'll come and get you purple, you know, but I was up there with Lynn, my wife, you know, and purple's okay when you're married. But we're, so we're walking along hand in hand at the camp and everywhere we went, they were going purple, you know, and 
calling on us. But you see in these things, you know, that there was a lot of purple going on in Corinth. And so many people think that, you know, Christianity is very prude in this subject. And of course, oftentimes, unfortunately, people mistake what the Bible says and don't really go along with it either and have a different understanding. And their own hang-ups or whatever problems may lead to something that's not a biblical teaching. But I believe that our culture is certainly obsessed with sex, but it has a very low opinion and view of it is the bottom line. And the Bible has a very high view of it. It actually has a more high view than our society does, which seems to worship it in some ways. And a lot of people do believe that the Bible teaches that sex is dirty, but not so. The Bible's not the least bit ashamed of sex. And in many places, God's word basically says to the married, hey, go for it. Drink deeply, my friends. Enjoy. And the world thinks, hey, we're missing out, man, you Christians with all that. You know, the way that you keep yourselves pure and things like that. I say this, you know what? You haven't had good sex until you've had God sex. Now, some would say, what in the world are you talking about here? <laughs> I'm talking about this. I'm talking about somebody who knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that, hey, we could pray in the bedroom. We could worship in the bedroom. We could actually have God present here and not be the least bit ashamed of that, actually be knowing that his blessing and his goodness is upon what we are enjoying here. One man, one woman for life, spending a life, loving and learning to love each other, giving to one another physically, emotionally, spiritually, not just organs, but two human beings fully alive in Christ together. And that's a way to share a soul with a person that God intended for us that the world is totally missing out on if they do not have the blessing of God upon their union in that way. And I do a lot of premarital uh, counsel here, and I do a lot of postmarital counsel here, and I do a lot of marital in the middle counsel here, and it's really ironic. You know, we talk about it sometimes that before you're married, man, Satan will tempt you to have sex with any and everyone. But after you're married, he'll tempt you not to have sex with the very person that God has put into your life for you to enjoy that way. And the problem so often is that because if a person puts the physical, it's the foundation. It's a terrible foundation. It's not meant to be the foundation. If there's no emotional intimacy in a marriage, if there's no spiritual intimacy in a marriage, over time, no matter how hot it started, you know what? There will be no physical intimacy in that marriage for long. Because God created us to be body, soul, and spirit and to enjoy the unity on all three of those. And if a person says, well, I'm going to unite our bodies without uniting our souls and spirit. Well, that's not going to work. It destroys the soul, in fact. It's just a take another little piece of my heart now, baby. And that's what happens. So many in our society are walking wounded in this because they said, oh, God's things, he's trying to ruin our fun. No, he's trying to preserve it. He's trying to protect it. And the great thing is, remember that verse, it said, such some of you were, but it doesn't have to be who we are. And God has a way of putting back what the locusts have stolen even. And so having sex outside of marriage is kind of like robbing a bank. Oh, you might get something out of it. There might be a payoff there. But you're taking something that really isn't yours in the end. And sex within a godly marriage is more the other way around. It's like making deposits into a shared bank account. And you're both richer. And you're both getting uh, pleasure without being ripped off. And so Paul's trying to get them to think it through. And us here tonight, you know, if you're a Christian, he's saying Jesus is in you. And that ought to make a very significant difference on what you want to do, not only with your body, but your spirit and the two cannot be separated. Jesus is in you. And would you take Jesus to the best little whorehouse in Texas? Would you? Would you take him to a brothel? Would you take him to a strip club? Would you take him to a website? Would you say, hey, let's go pick up, Jesus, let's go pick up some guy or some girl or girls, to, you know, we'll take them home for a one night stand. Would you want Jesus sitting there on the bed as you shack up with that person who you're really not committed to for life in the way that Jesus said we should be? And some of you say, man, that would spoil the mood, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's what he's saying. Unthinkable. Paul's saying that would. It'd do more than spoil the mood. It breaks the heart of the Lord and it breaks what he wants to do 
in our lives. So verse 17, he says, the one who's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So do this. Verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So that's the warning label number four that we see there. Control your urge to merge so that you would miss out on all that life has for you. No, so that you would have the greatest possibility of enjoying what God has for you. And sexual sin, as it says here, is so serious. It defiles like no other thing can, really. So personal, so intimate, that you look at those things and say, you know, only God's grace can make up what has been stolen. And it can. But you see, to use another person for your pleasure outside of God's will destroys not only you, but them. And you are the temple, he's saying there. God's dwelling, your heart, his home. And so many in Paul's day would have made that split, you know, and said, well, spiritually, I'm really into God. But, you know, my body is kind of mine. I do whatever I want with it. But there's a great problem with that that he addresses in that last verse there. He says, it's really not your body, see. You were bought. You were purchased. Uh, you were purchased at a price. And it wasn't money that purchased you. It was something more valuable than any gold. It was the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he's coming back to and saying, look, guys, he is in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope of change, the hope of a different kind of life than the rest of the world sees. You know, not just having to think, oh, I'm going to grab money or I'm going to get that lawsuit and boy, I'll be set for life or I'll get revenge on that person who wronged me. All those types of things. He's saying, no, see, when God comes into your life, your life's going to change. Overnight, immediately, well, yes, some things that way. Some things are going to take a lifetime to change. That's why you don't just immediately go be with the Lord the second you give your life to him because there's some things that he wants to work out over time. That's how relationships are formed. And I know in my life, God took some things immediately where I could say, hey, such I was, but I am not that anymore. And there's other things I look down that list and say, Lord, I'm still, I'm still dealing with that. We're still dealing with that one, aren't we? He said, yeah, I am still dealing with that. But you're not what you were and you're not what you will be. And so Paul, here he's looking at these things and he says, you know what, you're not your own. And I'm so glad I'm not my own. Man, when I was my own, I made quite a mess of my life and every life around it. I'm so glad that I went on the market and somebody bought me. You know who bought me? Jesus, highest bidder. And you think about this, I want to close with a story. You know, those wacky warnings, they may, you know, if you think back through them, make you laugh some, you know, don't use... A hairdryer while unconscious in the shower. You know, that, that is good. You know, if you, if you remember that from the night, that's good. But I hope you'll remember those four things because they can absolutely change our lives. And they may seem so obvious in some ways. Maybe some of you have heard some of these things before, but, you know, here's the thing. Many of us, if we ignore those warnings, guess what? Injury and death can occur. Those are the things that go on. And somebody probably died for a lot of those wacky warnings that you go, are, you know, is maimed for life. And you go, would anyone have tried that? Yes, somebody did. And so I close with a story just thinking about ownership and what it means in our life and what it does for us. There was a boy who was carving a little boat and he spent a long time on it, carved it beautifully, colored it wonderfully, you know, made a little sail for it and everything, out sailing it on the river. And one day it got away from him and it floated downstream and he wasn't able to see exactly where it went. And so he lost sight of it. Thought he'd maybe never see it again. And weeks later he was walking along through a little store and looks over in the window of the store and there's his boat. And he knows it's his because there's only one like it in the whole world. And it's sitting there, but it has a nice big price tag on it. And he looks at that and he thinks, man, it is worth that. It's worth that and more. And he goes in to talk with the shop owner. And he said, I'm sure he'll understand. You know, I, I, it's mine. You know, so he goes in and he tells the shop owner, hey, this is mine. I can tell you anything about it. I can even tell you what's on the inside of it that nobody else could see. I can tell you that's my boat. I lost it a few weeks ago. And the man said, that's true. I found it a few weeks ago. But hey, you know, finders keepers. Sorry, son. You can pay the price like anybody else. And so the kid went home and he began to mow lawns and he began to wash 
cars and do whatever he could do to earn whatever he could. And he finally had enough toward the end of that summer to pay for that boat. So he went back into that store and he bought it back. And when he got home, he told his dad this. You know what? I love this more than I have ever loved it because it's doubly mine. I made it and I bought it back. And it's worth more to me than anything could be. And it's worth more to me even than before I lost it. And I believe that really reflects the heart of God as you think about some of these warnings that he brings to our life. Why does he do that? Because he knows what it is to lose us. And he knows what it costs to buy us back. And we sail away into sin, you know, and we say, oh, this is the great life this way. And we have to remember and come back to sometimes what the price was paid and how that love was shown by not only making us and creating us, but recreating us in Christ. And so I want to close with an opportunity here tonight as we do each time we meet, just to think on what this means for a life change for you. And I'm going to ask uh, the musicians to come back up if they're in the room. Thank you. And uh, just close us out with a song. But I want to give an opportunity, as we do here, for anyone here who's not sure of that commitment that they've made to Christ. You know, and again, I, my desire is not to inject false insecurity in anybody's life. But, you know, Paul in here said, hey, if this is a characteristic of your life, don't be deceived. Don't think that, you know, all dogs go to heaven and, you know, just good folks go and all that type of thing. No, the Bible is so very, very clear on what it means to be a person who it says is washed, is sanctified, and is justified by the Holy Spirit. Because again, it's not a question of, okay, God, I'll do a lot better from here on out. You've given me some warnings, I'll try and do better. No, the Bible says it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. I spent a good part of my life trying to be a better person, trying to be a better husband, trying to be at least not you know, in the bottom half of humanity. And, and in some ways, you know, you can say, okay, well, God grades on a curve, right? No. The Bible says God grades on a cross, and he looks to the cross, and he says, that's the price paid. That's the price paid, you know, bought back. And if you don't know for certain that you've been bought back by the blood of Jesus Christ, tonight is your night to make that decision, to make that declaration. And all you need to do in doing that, in a few minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand. And by raise your, raising your hand, what you're saying is yes to Jesus, yes to Him as Lord, as Savior, as friend in your life. And in the same thing, you're also saying no. You're saying no to sin. You're saying no to the old life. You're saying no to what you were. And yes to what God says you can be and would be in Him. And so I'm just going to... Take a moment to pray, and if there's anybody at the end of that prayer, if you know that you need to make that decision tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand as we're here together. Father, I thank you for uh, your word, which gives warnings, Lord, but they're warnings born out of great love. And God, I pray that the great love that is shown in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, Lord, that that would hit the heart of every person here. And if there's anybody here tonight who does not know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they have been changed and washed and sanctified and justified, even if they don't even know what all those words mean, Lord, we know what it is to look at our life and say, hey, it used to be going that way, but I want to go your way, Lord. I don't want to do it my way anymore. I don't want to do it the way the world does it. God, I pray that you would give them the courage to make that decision and to make it public here tonight as we pray. And here, as our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, I'm just going to give an opportunity for anyone here in this room, if you know I'm talking to you and you need that, you need Jesus, you just say, Pastor, I want to pray that prayer to invite him into my life, to make him Lord and Savior. I'm just going to ask you to right where you're sitting to raise your hand at this time. Anybody here in the room, I see you there. Praise the Lord. Anybody else here? I'll just give it a couple seconds here. An opportunity to make your destiny sure. Anybody here? For you, raise your hand. I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer after me. It's a prayer of commitment to Christ. 
And it's really just responding to the love that he's shown us. Just pray these words after me. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the price paid for my sin. And I ask that you would forgive me and that you would give me new life in his name. I want to turn from my old life and I want to turn to you here tonight. And I thank you that you give me eternal life in the name of Jesus. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen.